<coughs> Scripture reading will be reading right from the overhead there. It's going to be Philippians 3, 12 through 16. <clears throat> and it says, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal it, even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. Certainly good to be back with you tonight. Just mentioned uh, dad's not here. I guess his cough was getting a little worse tonight, so he stayed home. But uh, add him to the prayer list. It's funny. I put that bulletin thing together, and I was thinking, who all need to put on there? I should put my dad on there and forgot to do it. But let's remember him as well. I forgot my clicker, Wes. Hope I got it in my pocket. So tonight's lesson is entitled, Become a Wise Investor. And of course, if you follow what's going on in the macroeconomics right now, there's a lot going on in the world, a lot of speculation about uh, we're in a unique time where inflation keeps rising, the Fed keeps raising the interest rate and doesn't seem to be curbing inflation and, and of course you got what's going on in China and Ukraine and Russia and, and so there's just a lot of uncertainty about what to do where to put money uh, wasn't all that long ago cryptocurrency was a big thing there's a bunch of folks made money from that and and so when you you talk to your portfolio manager they'll probably give you different advice depending on who you're talking to and um, and of course when we think about investment um, a lot of times you can see there's a slide contrast there, money, but what obviously I'm going to take a little spin on that and obviously talk about what we truly ought to be investing in. And it isn't money, but rather things of the spiritual nature. And the, the bulk of the lesson tonight is actually going to be based on a book that Solomon wrote, book of Ecclesiastes. Again, a book we are very familiar with. As I pointed out, it's, you know, it's been a roller coaster here lately. In fact, it's been more down than anything. Um, you know, since it was up to about 36,000, it's been down below 30. And anybody that's got a portfolio knows they've lost about 20% of their value. And people are uncertain, you know, what's going to happen. I was uh, just this last week, I was got invited to um, the Wheeling Chamber of Commerce had a, uh, they do an economic forum every year just talks about the valley and what to expect from uh, economics around the valley for this upcoming year. So it was actually, I went there and it was interesting. They had uh, some folks that are experts in portfolio management and economics and energy. And, but you know, it's, it's one of those things where it's difficult to know where to invest. And particularly if, if you're not familiar with the stock market, putting money, and giving money to someone and not knowing what company it's going into, whether good or bad, it's kind of a scary thing. And especially when you see things happen and you have and nobody, it's like nobody knows or can predict when it's going to happen. And so you may have been dealing with this. You may have had to deal with uh, some loss there. And we, even in our lifetime, we've experienced a lot of loss in, in, in terms of the financial markets. But again, um, Really, uh, when I talk about being a wise investor, I'm not talking about your money. I'm talking about things like your time and your, your energy and, and your mind. Um, so we just take inventory on where we are now. Um, 2 Corinthians 13 and 5, it says, examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith. Test your, yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? unless indeed you are disqualified. So we need to examine ourselves. And as we talked about, you know, looking in the mirror uh, this morning uh, of reflection, that, that should be something that's an everyday, part of our everyday lives is to examine 
where we are and do we have what we need or ought to have um in verse 12 through 14 of hebrews 5 it says for when the time you ought to be teachers give neither one teach you again which be the first principles of the oracles of god and are become such as of need of milk and not strong meat for every one that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness for he is babe but strong meat belong to them that are full of age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised both to discern both good and evil. And so where are you today? You, you do like this, take inventory of where you're at. And the question are, is, are you investing? Are you making an investment there? And are, so are we babes? Are we teachers? And certainly I think we all will recognize there's always room for improvement. And so when you think about who was a wise investor, and certainly on the names that should come to the top of your list is Solomon, right? He was wise. And you know what? He had lots of wealth. He had unbelievable amount of wealth. He also had an unbelievable amount of knowledge. So let's, let's sit at the feet of Solomon here for just a few minutes and listen to what he has to say. And, you know, in, in uh, chapter one, he says, uh, said the words of the pre of Ecclesiastes says the words of the preacher, the son of David, king of Jerusalem, vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which his toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. So vanity, of van all is vanity. And what he's talking about is things in this life. not spiritual things but the physical things in this life and we talk about investment he says though they're all vanity life is frequently dis is full of disappointment it's it's not always going to be fair there's folks who suffer oppression tragedy um and it and many times it doesn't seem like there's any point in it no meaning in it you can't explain you can't reason why things happen the way they do sometimes things happen but the important part here is to be a wise investor. Life under the sun is composed of uh, things in this life are vanity if we put our faith and trust in those. We should not take the message of Ecclesiastes to be negative. So many times you may say, this is such a Debbie Downer book. It's not. Um, it, we, and we shouldn't look at it and say, this book's just full of negativity. I don't want to read it. No, it's full of wisdom. We need to listen and hear what, what the wise preacher is saying. Uh, the wise man points us away from worthless things to the things in life that really matter. There are things in this life, these physical things. Those are the worthless things. There are some things that are really important, and that's what we want to focus on tonight. The last two chapters, which is what we're going to spend our time looking at tonight, talk about investing our resources, our time, our efforts, and abilities toward that which lasts instead of toward things that will perish. In 12 and 7, it says, and the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. So all these physical things that we're saving up, we're investing in, and I've done, I've, I've invested a lot of them. I've got property, I've got land, I've got cars, I've got these things. You know what? They're all going to be dust. They're all going to go back to dust. They're going to perish. And God will hold us accountable to our purpose in the end. Verse 13 says, in the end of the matter, all that has been heard, fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment and every secret thing, whether it be good or evil. And so we need to recognize and invest in the right things, not in things of this world, but things that will not perish. And so let's take a look for a minute at the book of Ecclesiastes. We're going to start with chapter 11. Read the first eight verses there where it says, Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Give a serving to seven and also to eight, for you do not know what evil will be on the earth. If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where the tree falls, 
there it shall lie. He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. As you do not know what is the way of the wind, or how bones grow in the womb of, who, of her who is with child. So you do not know the works of God who makes everything. In the morning, sow your seed, and in the evening, do not withhold your hand. For you do not know which will prosper, either this or that, or whether both alike will be good. Truly, the light is sweet, and it is pleasant for the eyes to behold the sun. But if a man lives many years and rejoices in them all, yet let him remember the days of darkness, for they will be many. All that is coming is vanity. We're going we're to break down these verses a little bit. Some of those may have been clear to you. Some may be not. We're going to actually dig into a little bit what Solomon is saying here, starting with the first couple of verses there. He says, cast your bread upon the waters. This is a metaphor for engaging in thankless, thankless toil. There are things that we are going to do. And you know what? We're not going to be, you're not going to get a pat on the back. Nobody's going to thank you for them. Um, it says, do good without hope return. So many times, most of the things we do in this life, we're doing it for a reason, right? We're expecting to get something back. But that's not true when you have a spiritual view of things. In fact, if you look there in Luke 14, 12 through 14, it says, he said also to the man who invited him, when you give a dinner or banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. You see the difference? different view here when you go to a party in this world usually who is it invite you it's a friend right somebody you know um the writer here talks about investing in those who can't pay you back you know it's much more rewarding to help someone else who can't that you're not and not expect anything in return who can't help you trust me when you help someone who can't help help you back you'll appreciate that so much more you may not be rewarded in this life but as the writer pointed out there we be repaid at the resurrection of the just. There'll be a day. There'll be a day when the just will be repaid and the unjust will also uh, be paid. It says, for you will find it after many days, he says there. It says, however, what we do now will be returned later. As we just talked a little bit about that. We'll look at a couple verses that point that out. Matthew 6, 4 says, that your charitable deed may be in secret and your father who sees in secret with himself will reward you openly. So we don't know when we, we do these things, these nice things for folks. We don't know. We're told here, God will repay us. Galatians 6, 9 says, and let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good unto all, especially those of the household of faith. You know, it sometimes gets tiring. Um, especially folks that constantly need a, a hand up. They're just constantly having to lift them up. It always, always seems like the same people, right? They're always down in the dumps. Um, but you know what? We should never grow tired of that. If we're able to help someone up, as, as, a, as a writer points out there, don't grow weary. You may not get paid back in this life, but eventually you will. And so we should not be doing good deeds and say, you know what? I've been doing all these good things. When's it going to come my way? When, when's all this good stuff going to flow my way? May not come in this life, but don't lose heart. You're doing the right thing. You'll, you'll be repaid. Give a serving to seven and also to eight. What do you mean by that? Diversify your investments. In fact, if you go to a, 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 an investor, a great portfolio manager is going to tell you, don't Put all your money in one thing, right? Don't put it all in one stock or one, uh, all in bonds or all in international uh, um, large companies or small companies. They'll tell you, you need to diversify, depending on where you're at in life. You don't want to all put all your eggs in one basket sometimes, we'll say. Um, you know, I like tangible assets. I don't like to put my money in things I can't see. 
fact, I've had a lot of people come to me and, you know, you probably have too. want you to invest money or put money in this, or that. I said, listen, I'm not investing in anything I can't put my hands on. And, uh, but folks will tell you that's the best strategy. Invest in a lot of things. Um, and so the writer here, he's saying there, do good for as many as you can, while you can, as often as you can. So many times when service is over, or who we go, to, we go talk to the same people, right? Or when we're talking about, you know, the congregation and the strength of the congregation here, we're constantly talking about our members that are here. There are plenty, you think there's anybody in Barnesville that aren't in need? It's not in need of the gospel. There's a lot of people out there. We should be reaching out to as many as we can. As I told you, you know, earlier this week, I, or last week, I guess, I had to, some individuals I had to talk to, and I thought, man, this is a good person. And I thought, how many times I walked past so many people and never spoke to them? I know that I, I would get along with this person, and I could probably help this person or certainly have a good conversation there, but we, we don't do that. We don't reach out to them. And Luke uh, 6 and verse 30 says, Give to everyone who asks of you, and from him who takes away from your goods, do not ask them back. And just as you want men to do to you, you do also unto them likewise. But if you love those who love you, what credit is that for you? For even the sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that for you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is it to you? For even sinners lend to sinners and receive as much back. But love your enemies, do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be the sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the unthankful and the evil. And so we're supposed to do good unto who? Everyone, even our own enemies. So many times we've got this small world, but as the writer points out, we need to be looking to help anyone we can. In 16 and 9, it says, And I say unto you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous men, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. You know what? It may seem like everything's going good and you're not going to need help. Do you know what? You might. You may be surprised. There may be somebody you, you know, if you have the ability to help folks, reach out to them because there may be a time when you're in need. And those people might be there for you. I can't think about, you know, Mrs. Ola, um, another reason to be good to your children. Because one of these days, you may need your children to help you. There's a good chance, actually a very good chance, you're going to need your kids. Um, 1 Timothy 6, 18, let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. And so as a writer points out there, um, we need to be willing to, to help and, and seek out others that we can help. Brethren, if a man would be overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. And so we need to be willing to reach out to others and help others. We need to invest in sacrificial living and, and most apply this principle to benevolence. Most of the time we think of, when we talk about sacrificial, we're talking about helping others financially. That's normally what comes to mind. But it's, it's many things um, in good works. In Romans 12 and verse 1 and 2, he says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercy of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so um, sac sacrificial, li sacrificial living is doing good to others. It's also, we talk about mercy and forgiveness there in Luke 6 and 38. Given that will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put in your bosom. But with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. And so we should treat others like we want to be treated. Nobody's perfect. We all make mistakes. And so we should be merciful and forgiving of others, recognizing, you know what? There's sometimes we make mistakes. And when we fall and we make a mistake and we're sorry about it, we don't want people to hold that against us. And so we need to be merciful and forgiving. 
Sacrificial living is also, you talk about evangelism, preaching and teaching. I think I quoted a stat a few weeks back when I preached. There's only like one third of all the churches in the, in the U.S. today have a full-time evangelist. You know why that is? Because it's not easy. It requires sacrifice. And my hat's off to men and their wives who commit their, themselves to the dedication of evangelizing. In 1 Corinthians 3, 5 says, Who then is Paul and who is Apollos? But ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. We must also invest in self-discipline. In Ecclesiastes 11, verses 3 and 4, it says that the clouds are full of rain. They empty themselves upon the earth. And if a tree falls to the south, to the north, or in, in the place where the tree falls, there it shall lie. He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. And so when you, you think about that, they empty themselves, there it shall lie. Though the future is uncertain, and we may find ourselves helpless against the forces of nature, and various realities of life. We cannot allow uncertainty to rob us of our diligence and our engagement in necessary activities. And so many times we let this idea of feeling helpless and not knowing what's going to happen to keep us from doing the things we need to do. Ecclesiastes 9.10 says, whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might. So always give it your all. Don't use uncertainty as an excuse to say, I'm not going to try because I don't know what's going to happen and I can't control what happens. Don't let that be an excuse for giving up. You know, there's a poem and it may take me a minute to read it, but I'm going to read it anyhow, because I think it's, it's, it's entitled dropping a pebble in the water. And it, I think it illustrates this concept very well. It says drop a pebble in the water, just a splash and it's gone but there's half a hundred ripples circling on and on and on, spreading, spreading from the center, flowing on out to the sea. And there's no way of telling where the end is going to be. Drop a pebble in the water, in a minute you forget. But there's little waves of flowing and there's ripples circling yet. And those little waves of flowing to a great big wave have grown. You've disturbed a mighty river just by dropping in a stone. Drop an unkind word or careless, in a minute it is gone. But there's a half a hundred ripples circling on and on and on. They keep spreading and spreading and spreading from the center as they go. And there is no way to stop them once you've started them to flow. Drop an unkind word or careless, in a minute you forget. But there's little waves of flowing and there's ripples circling yet. And perhaps in some and sad heart, a mighty wave of tears you've stirred. And disturbed a life was happy air you dropped that unkind word. Drop a word of cheer and kindness, just a flash and it's gone. But there's a half a hundred ripples circling on and on and on. Bearing hope and joy and comfort on each splashing, dashing wave. Till you wouldn't believe the volume of the one kind word you gave. Drop a word of cheer and kindness in a minute you forget but there's gladness still a swelling and there's joy a circling yet. And you've rolled a wave of comfort whose sweet music can be heard over miles and miles of water just by dropping one kind word. And I think it illustrates the point so well. So many times we're afraid that we, we don't think we're gonna have the effect or we, don't have, we can't control what happens. But I mean, if you ever tossed a, a pebble in the water and you can see that wave just go and it goes and it goes. And I think it illustrates very, very good the point that we, we need to make here. Don't let that be an excuse for not trying because I can't, you can't control the influence. But we know that that negative or positive influence can have lasting effects. We cannot allow our focus to be on the negatives of life. Doing good in the face of adverse circumstances requires self-discipline. And 
Um, I think we all have, have experienced this from some time or another. There is negativeness. You're going to be, there's going to be times when it just, um, you don't feel like there's, there's nothing you can do to help the situation or folks are constantly talking about why bother trying. You know, I remember, I remember when it was like this and now it's so depressing. Um, and you focus on that negativity and um, it, you like that pebble. You have you influence others for good or for bad. Proverbs three twenty seven and Matthew fourteen twenty eight says, and Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. When Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? In Proverbs 3, 27 says, do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power and your hand to do so. And so don't let negativity affect you and keep you from doing the things that you need to be doing. And we can't allow any apparent lack of success to dissuade us from continued faithfulness. You know, we're not always going to be successful. There's going to be times of failure. You may have reached out to someone so many times and said, you know what, I just, I've tried so many times. Uh, it's no good. I need to give up. Therefore, to the him to know it to do good and doeth it not. To him in a sin. James 4, 17. Keep trying. Don't let negativity and don't lack this parent lack of success keep you from doing what we need to be doing. <clears throat> you know, God's not going to accept our excuses. You may say, well, I just didn't have time, Lord. Proverbs 20 and 4 says, The lazy man will not plow because of the winter. He will beg during the harvest and have nothing. Proverbs 22, 13 says, The lazy man says, There is a line outside. I shall be slain in the streets. Matthew 25, 41, Depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devils and his angels. There are things we all recognize that we need to be doing. And God will not accept any excuse for not trying. There are many things we cannot know. We cannot comprehend. In uh, Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that they may do all the words of, of his law. And so there's some things we're just not going to know. Romans uh, 11 and 33 says, oh, the depth Oh, the depth and the riches of both the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become his counselor or who has first to given to him and it shall not be repaid to him for of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. You know what? There's some things you're just not going to know the answer to. I don't know if that frustrates you or not, but there are just some things only God knows. One of these days you can ask God and talk to God about it. We can't let that keep us from doing what we need to, need to be doing. If we really trust God, we'll continue to obey his commands, even if we don't fully understand the why of it or how it was accomplished in God's will. And you go back to um, Joshua chapter 6. And I can tell you from being a Physics major, there's no reason in the world the walls of Jericho fell down. Those guys walking around there, you know, say, well, he caused the disturb the earth and caused an earthquake. I'm sorry, there's no explanation for that. That doesn't explain what happened there in, in Joshua 6. In 2 Kings 5, Naaman. Why Naaman? Go down and, and, and dip in the Jordan seven times and he couldn't go over in some other rip, river and dip. It doesn't make any sense. It makes no logical sense. And try to explain that to someone in the world, you can't make reasonable sense out of that. Genesis 16 and 18, Abraham and Sarah, Sarah having a child at the age of 90, can't explain it. Don't know how that's possible. I don't know how Sarah could conceive at, at, that, at such an old age. In Mark 16, 16, he that believeth in is baptized. Why dipping in this water or burying in this water? can save me. You're telling me, Rick, that if, I, if I'm not buried in this water, I can't be saved? I can't explain it. I can tell you that's what God said. That's all I can tell you. 
That's what God said. And we got to believe it. And Acts 2.38, similar thing there. In Ephesians 5 and 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, sing, make a melody in your heart to the Lord. Why doesn't God accept instrumental music? That's a longer discussion, I know. There are certain things that God just wants to be done a certain way. And you can reason and logic, why, why does God want it that way? It's not for us to question. It's not for us to question. We need to just listen to what God is saying to us. In verse 7 and 8, keep clicking my butt too many times. Truly the light is sweet, and it is pleasant for the eyes to behold the sun. But if a man lives as many years and rejoices in them all, yet let him remember the days of darkness, for they will be many. All that is coming is vanity. You know, it's so true. It's not, life is not going to be all roses. There's going to be some tough times. There's going to be some dark days. And we're going to experience those. If you haven't, you certainly will. <clears throat> but we need to invest in today. This is why we need to invest in today. There's going to be dark days, but if we're Christians, there's things we need to take care of now. Today's a day of salvation, 2 Corinthians 6, 2. For he saith, I have heard thee that in time accepted. The day is the day of salvation. I have succumbed to thee. Behold, now is acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We need to recognize that today we need to do something. Faithfulness brings true fulfillment and joy to life. Acts 16, 34. And when they had brought them into this house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God and in all his house. And so faithfulness will bring you joy and will bring you happiness. We have today, we know we have today, we have no guarantee of tomorrow. And so we need to make sure that, that we take care of things today. Ecclesiastes 9, 10 says, who has... Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. After we die, there's nothing we can do about it. But you have now. We have today. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow will take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And so we need to recognize that we have time and opportunity now we need to redeem the time because the days are evil ephesians 5 and verse 16 in chapter 11 9 through 10 he says rejoice O young man in your youth and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes but know that all for all these things will bring you into judgment. Therefore, remove sorrow from your heart and put away evil from your flesh for childhood and youth are vanity. So the earlier we start doing it, the better. That's the message here. Solomon says you need to start earlier when we're young. You may say, well, you know, I'll take care of that when I get older. No, we need to do it while we're young. We need to do it before difficult days come. In 12 and 1, it says, remember thy creator in the days of thy youth. Don't wait till I'm, you're old. Um, you know, and again, for sake of time, I won't go through it, but we've talked about Ecclesiastes 12. And, and you know, one of these days, there's things you're going to want to do, and you're not going to be able to do it. How many times people say, you know, when I get old, I'm going to travel. I'll have money. My kids will be taken care of. Then I'm going to do that. Or I'm going to play a lot of golf. You know, when I retire, I'm going to play a lot of golf. You know what? I may not be able to play golf very well. Or hunt or fish or whatever it might be. And so don't put it off. The earlier we do things, the better. We need to invest in the future, as 12 through 7 through 14 says. And, and um, we need to go back here. It says, then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Vanity of all vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yes, he pondered and sought it out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find acceptable words, and what was written was upright. Words of truth. The words of the wise are, are like goads, and the words of the scholars are, are like well-driven nails given by one shepherd. And further, my son, be admonished by these, O making of many books, there is no end, and much study is wearisome to the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is man's all 
For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether they be good or evil. And so we need to invest now. We need to invest in the future. We need to place greater value on spiritual things. So we bring wrap our, our lesson up tonight is Matthew 6 and 33, seek God first. We need to invest in these things that have greater things, not things of this world, not the, the money and, and, and physical things, but rather spiritual things. We need to increase our spiritual focus. In, um, in chapter 6, verse 22 says, and the light of the body is the eye, and therefore thine eye be single, the whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, the whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters, for either he will hold the one and despise the other, or else he will despise the other and, uh, and hold, hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. We can't serve them both. We can't serve the world and invest in the world with all our heart and invest in God. It's got to be one in that, uh, or the other, and it's got to be God. Bearing more fruit by growing in my knowledge of Christ and his likeness, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. That's, those are the things we need to be investing in. Things that are going to bear spiritual fruit. And then we need to press diligently towards the goal, as we noticed in our scripture reading. I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That needs to be our focus. That needs to be our goal. So become a wise investor. And I don't mean in physical things, but rather spiritual things. And so I ask you a question tonight. Are we investing our resources, our time, our efforts, our abilities in things which will last eternally or the things that are going to perish? I hope that we're investing in those things that will be lasting. And so if you're in our audience and never been um, obeyed the gospel, you have an opportunity to be saved tonight, hearing the word. You believe in Jesus. Uh, Repent of your sins and make that great confession and be baptized. And I can't tell you why God chose burial and water. But that's what he did. To confirm that you believe in Jesus, you've got to be buried just like Christ was buried in the earth and, and, and rose up. We've got to be buried in that water to receive forgiveness of sin. If you've never done that, you need to do that. And then we need to live faithfully. The invitation is open now. If we can assist you in any way, please come while together we stand while we sing. Oh, dear.